So I haven't done a, um, a follow-up in a while and that's because it's not good news. <laughs> I, um, I'm still not having any luck with the NHS. Um, I'm back on a waiting list after both them and I agreeing <clears throat> that the half an hour phone call once a fortnight wasn't going to really cut it with regards to therapy and recovering from agoraphobia, anxiety and panic attacks that I've suffered with for like 25 years. So I'm back on a waiting list for a more intensive treatment, which apparently is one hour a fortnight face to face in the next town, which means I have to take lorazepam to get there, which means any information I'm given is going to be very hard to retain because if you know anything about lorazepam, you'll know that it's um, it has an amnesic effect. So, you know, your memories are hazy after a couple of days. You forget half of what you've done, where you've been. So I took things, matters into my own hands and I have searched and searched and searched for treatment facilities because I feel I'm at the stage now where trying CBT or CAT, you know, once a week or once a fortnight you know, if I decided to, to pay a psychologist and do that, is just not enough. You know, sometimes you know that you need your habits to be broken, your daily routine, your safety, you know, habits, all the, all the, the things that you do to keep yourself safe, in your mind, to keep yourself safe, that you do so, it, it's involuntary now, it's so ingrained that you just do it. For example, I won't go anywhere without a bottle of water in my, back, in my bag because I feel that if I'm panicky and my mouth is dry, one way to make myself feel a little bit better is to be able to sip water. Um, and I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got hundreds, you know, not, I don't go in other people's cars. I'll always, you know, drive myself. Um, I always prefer to do things alone because then if I get somewhere and I'm panicking or freaking out, I haven't got to explain myself to the person or people that I'm with. I can just leave. Um, uh, I could go on and on and on, but I won't bore you. But I, all of these, you know, little habits, little safety nets, little crutches that I'm giving myself that I've built up over years and years, they need to be broken down. And so I would like, you know, um, residential treatment. You know, it might seem extreme, but I'm reaching, I'm reaching crisis point basically. I've spent so much time at home alone um, over the years. I feel I've wasted, you know, a large portion of my life and my family and friends miss out because I don't go to things, you know, or if I do, I've got to take lorazepam to get there and, uh, you know, I'm just, it's not fun. It's not, it's not as it should be. You know, I can't do anything spontaneous. Things have to be booked well in advance for me. And even then there's no assurance that I am going to make it. And the invitations become less and less, you know, they're very few and far between because people come to, to think of you as unreliable, you know, that you're not, you're not going to come. What's the point of inviting her? She's not going to come. So, um, I mentioned in a previous video that I found umpteen private, um, facilities that are literally thousands and thousands of pounds for just a week. And I mean, most places do like a 12 week <coughs> boo. Stop it, silly girl. Sorry, I'm talking to the dog. Um, they do like a 12 week program. Well, if you can imagine, for example, the Priory quoted me 6,230 pounds a week. Well, if you're doing 12 weeks, whew, that adds up. I did find a facility that takes both private patients and NHS referrals in Kent. And um, I got really excited. I thought, well, that's brilliant. I read all of the, 
the um, information it said you need to be referred by a psychologist a, you know psychiatrist or something along those lines so I rang the psychiatrist that I saw the one and only time I saw her and she discharged me back to the GP who just totally does nothing um, unless you contact them and um, asked her to refer me to which she said no I, I won't refer you and I can't refer you um, for many reasons I said well I'd be interested to know why and she said well we haven't explored all avenues with you yet and I explained about the half an hour phone call that I was offered once a fortnight and how that wasn't really suitable for my issues and problems and um, she said oh well I'll contact the prison you know the well-being team and I, you know we'll try and fast track you but what you need to do to get a bit further and to um, to get seen again by another psychiatrist because I'm leaving in a week you need to go back to your GP and they will then refer you to a psychiatrist and I, I reminded her that this whole journey on this instance I went to my GP in February I got to see her in I believe it was the end of July and I still haven't received any treatment and we're now in October other than a change of medication because they're more than willing to throw medication at you she even suggested I go back on antidepressants which I said no thank you to um, so you can imagine if I'm back on a waiting list well if I go back to my GP and ask to be referred again how long I'm going I mean it'll be a year probably before I actually get to see you know a year from February to actually getting to see another psychiatrist and even then there's the possibility that they will offer the same treatment that the first psychologist offered and I won't get the referral that I want to this place in Kent it's just there is no the NHS is failing people miserably with mental health problems and all of this that they plaster on the um, you know on the TV about you know World Mental Health Day and it's okay to not be okay and let's stop the stigma and bring it out in the open what's it actually doing for people what are people gaining from it are they getting any extra help no in my opinion no they're not you know everyone's overstretched everyone's underfunded there just isn't the help that people need and therefore unless you are literally suicidal they or a danger to someone to, to people they will not do anything in a hurry so that's where we're at at the moment um, Oh, no, I did actually ring the place in Kent after hearing that she wouldn't refer me. I rang them and I said, you know, what if I went private? You know, because I am interested in, in what you're offering and your facility sounds amazing and the treatment, you know, is just what I need. Um, she said, well, we do a 16-week course. You know, it's inpatient. I said, well, that's just what I'm looking for, you know. She said, yeah, um, about the cost, it's just shy of £40,000. Four zero, just shy, so 39000 something or other, but just shy, basically just shy of £40,000 to get treatment, which sadly I do not have. So that idea has gone out the window and at the moment I'm part of me is wondering if I should just accept that this is where I am and my life is going to be limited and just try and enjoy what I have got. You know, I have got Lorazepam. It does give me a little bit of freedom. Um, I can do a few things. I don't take it every day. I only take it when I am going to do something that stretches me or if something you know stressful has happened and I'm panicking at home um, I might take a half but I, I don't want to become reliant or addicted to it but what I do know is that it is 
very, very important for me to have it in my life, to know that it's there. You know, if one of my children needed to go to hospital without lorazepam, I couldn't go, I couldn't take them. And, and, and recently, this year, my son has been to hospital and he had an operation and he has to go to appointments at not my lo most local hospital, but the next hospital, which um, is, I believe, 22 miles away. And I have to go with him. Um, you know, we've been a lot this year. Now, if I didn't have lorazepam, I couldn't take him. So, yeah. That's, that's, that's the update for uh, October. Hope things are good with you. <laughs>